now for something completely different. Uh, <laughs> um, Fung, I think unlike most advances in biotechnology, CRISPR has uh, achieved a, a real level of cultural penetration where I think that, uh, and the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, people have a good idea that this is a, a revolutionary gene editing technology. Um, but can you tell me like, how it exactly works? Sure, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, so CRISPR is a gene editing system and you can think of it as a word processor or Microsoft Word uh, for the genome. So the genome uh, encodes um, the blueprint for life. It's the DNA that's inside of our cells. And the genome has three billion letters, so it's a very long document. Now, if the genome was really a document in Microsoft Word, trying to edit it would be pretty simple. You would open up the search and replace function, type in where you're trying to find, locate in the, in the document, and then Word will automatically place the cursor in exactly where you want to edit. Then you can backspace the delete, and then you can type in uh, the, the right word to put into the document. But the genome is not in Microsoft Word. And so the way the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, system works is that you can give it a short strand of RNA. And this RNA has been pre-programmed to recognize the specific uh, DNA sequence in our genome so that it's like the search string that you're typing into the search box in Word. And Cas9 is the protein, and it takes this RNA and then it goes into our DNA, our genome, and searches along the DNA until it finds a place where the RNA and the DNA match each other. When that happens, Cas9 uh, acts as a nucleus, so it's the scissors for cutting DNA, and it will literally make a cut in where that, that RNA matches the DNA. When that happens, this DNA cut is the equivalent of a cursor in Microsoft Word. And, um, and the cell will react to this double-strand cut and then start to edit uh, the DNA sequence. You can give it a new piece of the DNA that carries the new information that you want to uh, incorporate into the genome, and the cell will, uh, will by itself incorporate that in, and you can, uh, using that, edit the genome. Um, wow, yeah. <laughs> uh, I find that mind-blowing every time I hear about it. Um, but I, and I, I know that you are not a historian of science, but I, I wonder if you could give us some sense. Uh, if we look at the history of biotechnology, um, what are the big breakthroughs over time, and how does CRISPR, like, how does CRISPR compare to them? Sure, it's, it's a long history. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, in fact, we have been manipulating genetic information of living organisms for thousands of years. It began with agriculture, where we begin to uh, cross and breed and try to uh, generate uh, new crops with improved traits, um, more yield or drought resistance, you name it. But that's really sort of antiquity type of uh, genetic engineering. Um, what we do now really began with the revolution in molecular biology, um, probably the discovery of uh, restriction enzymes, which are proteins that are also from bacterial cells uh, that allow scientists to be able to splice DNA together. And that underscored the revolution in molecular biology. It uh, launched uh, major companies like Genentech and Biogen that have ushered in this new way of molecular therapeutics. And then since then, um, the next really major thing probably has to do with the sequencing of the human genome. Uh, with the ability to sequence, we can now read every single letter in our genome. The human genome has three billion letters. We, we know um, these d different DNA letters. And so after that, um, after we're able to read the genome, uh, we now want to be able to modify the genome. Because as you sequence the genome of many individuals, we're now learning uh, genetic differences that may underscore disease or genetic differences that may underscore improvement uh, in health, uh, reducing risk for disease. And so how do we do that? Um, that's where the gene editing uh, technology comes in. CRISPR-Cas9 is not the first technology that allows us to edit the genome, but it's one of the easiest technology that makes it um, cheaper and also much faster to do it. You can think of the older technology um, as, um, so you watch, we, we watch TV, and the TV has to be tuned into a specific TV station to receive the signal. Now, the older technology, you have to build a new TV for each TV station that you want to receive. But CRISPR-Cas9 is, is a TV that you can tune uh, two different stations. You don't have to build a brand new TV uh, just to be able to watch uh, your favorite program. 
one of the things that strikes me about this technology is that we've, we've actually been mis-IDing you as the inventor of CRISPR. In fact, you did not invent CRISPR. Um, bacteria invented CRISPR. And so, and, and we're merely borrowing this technology from bacteria and sort of using it for our own ends. And I wonder, uh, and I know this is work you're engaged in, um, when you look at sort of the intricate machinery of, of bacteria, are there other tricks like this that we might be able to steal? Nature is probably the greatest inventor of all times. Um, so we certainly didn't invent uh, CRISPR, the bacterial immune system. Uh, nature invented it so that bacteria can adapt and be able to evolve so that it can counteract against viruses or DNA that enter these bacterial cells. It's, it's a very powerful immune system. What we invented is we took this natural system and then we made it so that we can use it to edit the genome of human cells or plant cells or eukaryotic cells uh, overall. And so CRISPR is only one of many, many different systems. And usually when we talk about CRISPR, um, people are referring to CRISPR-Cas9. Turns out that there are many different CRISPR systems. Um, a couple of years ago, um, we collaborated with a scientist at the Na uh, National Institute of Health, and we found something called CRISPR-Cas13. And using this one, um, we, are, we were not only able to um, use Cas9 to edit genome, we can also use CRISPR-Cas13 to be able to diagnose and detect virus infections or bacterial infections or even cancer DNA uh, at, with much higher level of sensitivity and, and with very fast speed and also is very, uh, very inexpensive. Yeah, and I, so you said something interesting there. You said that nature is, is the best inventor of all time and <coughs> CRISPR really represents a sort of uh, uh, a radical expansion of nature's own creativity, right? Because you bring the human mind to bear on it. And I wonder, um, what are the, the first person, when I, whenever I've uh, had occasion to talk to the layperson about CRISPR, the first thing naturally they want to know about is medicine. So where, what is this new creativity enabling in the field of medicine? CRISPR is a, is, <coughs> it's a very exciting and, and very broadly applicable tool. So there's application in medicine, in agriculture, in research, in many different areas. In medicine, one of the most exciting potential is the ability to use it to treat genetic disease. Mm -hmm. So as we sequence the human genome, we're now identifying um, specific mutations that may underscore grievous diseases. So to date, there are over 6,000 diseases that have been identified that have underlying uh, mutations. Disease like sickle cell disease, or cystic fibrosis, or epilepsy, and many other diseases, we now know what the underlying genetic cause is. And so you m we may think that uh, if we can go into the disease uh, affecting cells, and be able to modify the DNA in those cells so that we can remove uh, this specific cause causative mutation, then we can have a way to recover or, or rescue the disease um, uh, symptom uh, in these patients. And so that's what uh, the gene editing system has a promise to do. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting because it's a way to get at the root cause of a disease, not just masking the symptom, but completely getting rid of the underlying cause. And that has the potential to lead to cures uh, for, for many different uh, genetic diseases. What about, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What about uh, diagnostics? Um, I've been reading that uh, CRISPR could make it so that you, if you were, if there were an Ebola outbreak um, somewhere in Africa, that you could make very cheap, like just like strips that could take saliva that could identify mm -hmm. Ebola in someone's system just mm -hmm. immediately on the spot. Is that something? Are we going to see diagnostics like that everywhere? I, I think so, and I hope so. Uh, in fact, um, I think CRISPR-based diagnostics, uh, based on CRISPR-Cas13, not, not based on CRISPR-Cas9, may actually be one of the, the earlier things that you will see um, coming out as, as an application in the real world. Mm -hmm. CRISPR-Cas13 uh, is a protein that you can easily program, like Cas9, uh, to be able to detect different kinds of viruses or bacteria. If you want to detect E. coli infection or pseudomonas or tuberculosis infection, you just design a different RNA that would recognize the genome of those organisms. Or if you want to detect Ebola virus or Zika virus, you can do the same. The nice thing about CRISPR-Cas13 mm -hmm. is that it's, it's cheap to produce and also is, is very rapid and also very stable. So you can spot this onto a piece of filter paper and then create something very similar to a pregnancy test mm -hmm. so that you can use out there in the field uh, where the outbreak is happening, or the patient can diagnose at home uh, rather than having to go into the hospital. All along the way, the disease is being spread, and, and containment is a huge issue. 
And so I think that's a really exciting uh, possibility in the future. Yeah. Um, <coughs> I know that this is also making science much easier. We actually recently ran a story by one of our staff writers, Ed Young, uh, where uh, a scientist had actually used CRISPR-Cas9, I believe, uh, to go in and manipulate the genes that paint butterfly wings. Um, and was able to, they were able to like play with the patterns and the colors and they would show up in the next generation of butterflies almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And I was really struck by this quote at the end of the article that Ed got from this scientist where he said, we had dreamed about this as like a, a science fiction possibility that someone two generations down would be able to do. And now this is like an undergraduate project. <laughs> um, uh, are you getting, I mean, are you getting thank you notes from scientists? Like is this, uh, where else are you seeing research being made much more easier by these techniques? Um, <laughs> so it's funny you mention it. So in fact, I think one of the major, the biggest impact that CRISPR is having uh, in, on the, in the world right now is accelerating science, acceler accelerating research. The genome is, is large, three billion letters, and so it's very complicated. Mm -hmm. And in fact, uh, only 1% uh, or very small fraction of the genome actually encode um, proteins. The rest of it is called non-coding sequence or called dark matter of the genome. We don't really know how the dark matter works, but some of the most interesting aspects may actually un uh, lie in those dark matter. CRISPR is making it possible for scientists to study those uh, information that we don't know with unprecedented pace. It used to take a graduate student or a scientist many months, if not a couple of years, to be able to make a single genetic change. But now with CRISPR, they can do it in a matter of weeks. And so it's with this kind of acceleration that we are <coughs> going to be able to much more rapidly um, understand biology, answer unknown questions, and that together, that new information knowledge uh, will help us build new medicine and, um, and, and do many other useful things for the world. Yes. Uh, Recently, uh, scientists used CRISPR to edit a human embryo in the United States for the first time. This had been tried in China several times uh, mm -hmm. with some success, but uh, as I understand it, with widespread errors. And uh, I'm always at great pains to explain to people that this <coughs> emphatically does not mean that the, the era of designer babies is upon us. Um, but is that a future possibility? I mean, can you foresee, uh, and in what amount of time, uh, a world in where people are able to select uh, just uh, pre-birth for traits like uh, intelligence, for instance. So designer baby makes great headlines, but it's actually <laughs> really something that's, that's you know, pretty far away from, from what we can do now. Mm -hmm. um, for a couple of reasons. One, we don't really know um, the genome all that well. Uh, mm -hmm. For the vast number of things that you would want to do, we actually don't know how to do it. We don't really know how to make a baby with a, blue, uh, with a pair of blue eyes. But we don't know how to increase IQ by 20 points. Mm -hmm. um, and so it will probably take decades, if not longer, to really understand that. But a second thing which is even mm -hmm. more important is that even if we knew something about the genome, the genome is so complicated that there are complicated interactions between these different traits. I'll give you one simple example. So nowadays, there are a small percentage of individuals not nowadays, but there's just small percentage of individuals who carry a mutation in a gene called CCR5. And those individuals are immune to HIV virus infection. So you may think that this is a great thing to introduce into the population, but maybe to eradicate uh, AIDS. It turns out that just because it reduces the infectability of HIV virus uh, in human, it increases the susceptibility for West Nile virus. Hmm. So we don't have a West Nile mm -hmm. virus epidemic right now, but you can imagine if we mm -hmm. prophylactically introduce this into the population, we're gonna end up with a serious problem if and whenever West Nile virus resurfaces. Mm -hmm. And so that's all to say the genome is so complicated, we don't wanna be playing God, mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and we have to be very thoughtful and very careful. So that means we can... Um, <laughs> We can put off any sort of ethical fears we might have about designer babies for some time. Um, nonetheless, are there applications of this technology that do give you pause ethically? What do you worry about? Um, CRISPR is a powerful technology, and, and one, of the, one of the applications that scientists are exploring is designing something mm -hmm. called a gene drive. So gene drive is a way of using CRISPR so that you can very rapidly spread a genetic trait 
uh, in the population. So um, people have uh, thought about using this uh, gene drive system to be able to eradicate mosquito. Uh, you introduce a, a trait that makes them sterile so that they will spread that trait and then eventually they can't breed anymore and the whole species will, will go extinct. Now that's something that I think we need to be very thoughtful and careful about before we, <laughs> we deploy something like that. Um, certainly, um, you know, before we deploy it, de developing ways so that you can contain the spread of this, uh, this gene drive system and so forth, um, that's going to be very important. So we have to be very careful and thoughtful uh, to do that. But with that being said, you know, species are going extinct all the time too. So this is not something that CRISPR is going to be causing in the world, but it's more of something that we really need to be thoughtful um, as we move the technology forward. Uh, you'll note that here in Washington, the uh, being thoughtful about eradicating mosquitoes was not an applause line. <laughs> 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 um, I want to ask you about a, uh, a subject that is close to my heart. Recently for our magazine, I wrote about the quest to bring back the woolly mammoth mm -hmm. uh, using uh, CRISPR to edit the genome of Asian elephants, which are not too distant, actually, mm -hmm. uh, genetically from woolly mammoths. Um, and I know that uh, George Church, who's spearheading this project, is a, a friend and colleague of yours. And so I, I hope you'd tell us whether uh, maybe there's a baby mammoth in a tank <laughs> somewhere in Boston. Uh, you can deliver that news here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to disappoint you. But <laughs> um, I, I mean, I, I got started into molecular biology after watching Jurassic Park. So, uh, so <laughs> pretty interesting. <laughs> but with that being said, um, there's so much of biology. Uh, biology is really at a very rudimentary stage. We have made a lot of progress, great progress already, but there's still so much more that we don't understand. And for something like resurrecting an extinct animal, um, it's not just going to be CRISPR. There are many other technologies that have to be devel developed. A lot of biological knowledge has to be understood and gained um, before we can make that a possibility. So I think, I think we have to be a little more patient about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, boo. No. Um, uh, Fung, thank you for being with us today. That was fascinating. Thank you very much. <laughs>